Okay. It seems it's working now. Uh, first, thanks uh, everyone for for coming over here. Uh, it's the first time I'm in this huge room as a speaker. I tend to come here to watch movies, and it's kind of weird. Uh, and I'm gonna talk to you about how we use the uh, the data at Cabify. As probably if you're here, uh, you know about Cabify. Uh, it's basically a company that has grown a lot lately. This what this is what everybody knows about it, about us. Uh, we are a ride-hailing company in Spain and Latin America. We are, I mean, this is kind of, well, we, we are one of the first, at least, if not the first, uh, Spanish unicorn. And what not everybody knows, but I can share with you without getting fired, is that uh, we actually play in one of the most competitive industries nowadays. And the metric, because you are data people, is the billions of VC funding than mobility as a service companies have raised in the, in the last 10 years. Uh, all our tech is built in Madrid and Sao Paulo, and we grow exponentially uh, for real. Uh, because you are data people, you understand that this might look exponential, but when I do this, and in the logarithmic scale, this is a straight line of 20% of 20 monthly growth within five years, that means that it's truly exponential, right? Uh, and apart from having someone that really looks like a business school case study, but it, I told you that it's happening for real, uh, the cool thing of this hypergrowth is that uh, now we can start understanding the cities where we operate, and the best way to understand is using our very own data. Uh, for example, this is uh, a city. I, I think that people in the, in the audience can guess the city. And the cool thing here is there is actually no map. I am just throwing points in Cabify drop of locations. And as you can see, you can identify the patterns of where are the streets, where is the Retiro Park. Uh, this belt of, of black around the city is the, the highway, the M30. Obviously, we don't drop off passenger in there. That wouldn't be safe at all. Uh, and and, and it's, it's, it's kind of cool. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that Many people in the, in the audience is familiar with the Facebook, Facebook world map. And the, and this is kind of the, of the same thing. I have so much data that I can understand the, the map draws itself. Uh, and this is the, the point that I will be making during my, uh, my entire uh, talk. And because I am not really good at convincing people, I, I tell the same thing many times, so that by the end of the talk, you will be convinced. And is that because we are a non-mature industry, we can get huge impact applying simple solution. And I give the counter example. If you are trying to use data science or machine learning to optimize the, the supply chain of an Airbus, of the Airbus 380, you maybe get some, but in the end you are looking at a problem that many people have, many smart people have been looking at in the past 20 years. So the, the, the impact that you have is probably incremental. While uh, at Cabify and other rehealing companies, we are facing uh, problems that literally no one has faced ever until the last five years because the, the problem itself didn't, didn't exist. So one of the things I see people are, are doing uh, more and more often, how many of you use Datadog in your companies? And how many of you use it for things that was not designed for? It's because I, I'm seeing this trend of hacking uh, monitoring system that scale well. Uh, in principle, Datadog was designed for, for, uh, for looking at systems, right? At computers, uh, CPU, memory, whatever. We actually found that we could hack it and provide our operations teams with real-time information about how the city uh, is performing. And it was uh, super nice that the last month I was in, in Sao Paulo, and the operations teams were looking at the, at the success rate, which is basically how, how much of the demand are we, are we able to serve in real time to activate campaigns to send to drivers uh, based on that. And there was literally a row of computers with that dashboard that I thought it would be useless uh, for, the, for, the business, uh, for the business team. 
and, and they were like added to, to see just like traders would do, right? Uh, so it's, it's an example of something like super simple that we are, we are getting a, a lot of value from. Um, it's also cool when you have that much data, you, <laughs> you understand the city. Uh, does anyone remember what happened in Mexico City in that date? There was an earthquake, right? And just looking at our connectivity from drivers, you were able to see the exact minute of the, of the earthquake because uh, basically the, the mobile system went down and then, I mean, most of them, as you see, we, we kept some drivers, uh, drivers connected, but it's like out of the blue, you built a, a, a seismographer, but because you are uh, gathering so much information on so much people, you really can feel the, the big events, even with super simple tools. Uh, so again, the, the point of, of, of the talk is that we get huge impact from simple solutions. Uh, another thing is dynamic pricing. All right handling companies have dynamic pricing. We were one of the last to, to get there, and we did because the competition was hard for getting drivers in the peak hours. Uh, but the, the, the systems that we, that we built, uh, this is the first system, now we have something a bit more complicated, but the, the basics is the same. It's like, yeah, we will, uh, every minute, we will see how, how good we're, we were serving the last 20 minutes of, of journeys in, in different hexagons around the city. There you see a map. And basically, if there were many people waiting for a long time, we raise the price. If there, is, uh, if there isn't uh, as many people as there used to be, or the trend is going down, then we, we lower the price. So basically, we are just now casting. It, we, are not, we don't have a forest, forecasting uh, stage. And we are using a feedback loop where the user is part of the feedback loop, right? If we would go too high in price, they would stop ordering and therefore scarcity would, uh, would go down. And um, basically, we, we just do that, and then we do some smoothing so that is, uh, you don't feel like you are in a casino when you're ordering. So it's temporally and, and spatially uh, smooth. And just by using this super simple system, uh, this is uh, the, the, the rights with, with a supplement, high demand supplement. Uh, um, on November 14th, we, last year, we launched the pilot in Bogota, and 23 days, three days later, we were full production in all of the cities at Cabify, and for such a simple system, it took like 17 days to generate $1 million additional revenue for the drivers, which was the, the aim of the project. So it helped us building the, uh, the case of, of simple solution with huge impact. Just the idea of the project was to increase the 20, 15 to 20% uh, driver earnings during peak hours. Uh, and then we, we came up with a funny way to, uh, to measure. That is like, if you have done a ride with 20% supplement, it's like a, a ride with 0.2 rides happen in a new city that we just founded, that is Surtropolis. Surt, because it's the, the technical name of the, of the thing. And the, the, the cool thing is like just the first week in full production, we had generated over 120,000 virtual rides in value for our, for our riders. And it's kind of cool because to get, uh, to, get to that, they need typically to work over 100,000 hours and drive for 2.8 million kilometers that we just created value out of the blue, out of battle balance in the, the marketplace. Uh, Another idea, this, is, this gets a bit more complicated. Uh, all right hailing apps, we love our matching system because it's where we feel matching system, the idea is super simple. It's like when you have a ride, who is the driver that should receive uh, the ride? Um, and it's actually where we bring a, a measurable impact in the world. So comparing to hailing taxis on the, on the street, the usage of right hailing apps because they can see the entire city and make uh, cl more close to optimal decisions. Uh, the idea is like a typical taxi driver is only busy 30% of the time. 
while our drivers are on average busy for 55% uh, of the time. So we are pretty close to double the productivity of the overall system. Uh, how that happened? Well, uh, before there was a, a data dim, we were doing something smart, but probably overly simple, that which was, okay, I will get the, the rider who has been the longest on the queue, uh, and, I, and if there is, some, uh, there is some, uh, some driver available within X kilometers, and those were like manually set uh, radius by local teams, uh, we, will, we will assign that, that driver. And we call that, this the greedy approach, because it's fairly easy to understand why uh, doing things this way can get to suboptimal decision. I will show an example later on. And what we did in, the, in several iterations with experiments and so on is like, yeah, we instead of uh, considering bare distance, we will try to use ETAs because, you, for example, Rio de Janeiro is a city where there are like big mountains in between and you can be in the map very close, but it might take you one hour uh, to, get, uh, to get to the point. Uh, also, the idea is instead of using manually set uh, ready, this happens when companies grow big. Uh, by the, before we kill this, we end up having like 18,000 uh, manually defined rules on what should be the, the radius in some certain areas of a city for sending products a certain hour on a weekday, on a weekend. It was, it was absolutely impossible to, to test. Um, and the, the other thing we, we did is like instead of doing the greedy approach, the journey by journey, uh, we solved the, the Hungarian algorithm, which is a uh, 100-year-old math for, for assignment problem. Basically, what it allows us to do is like, uh, depending on if we were lucky or not, uh, we might be matching riders and drivers that way, just depending on who ordered first. But if we can consider the entire city, uh, we can mathematically be sure that we will do the, the green assignment, which is much shorter. Uh, <clears throat> again, uh, we measured this for real. Our experimental setting was like during 13 minutes in each city, we will have matcher A working, and do this in 10, uh, 13 minutes, we will have matcher B, and we will do this for a, for a long period of time uh, to avoid any seasonality or, or whatever. And the, what we measure is that uh, our pickups are not shorter and faster. On average, they are like 30 seconds. Uh, 30 seconds faster, with at our scale, by the time we are now bigger, but by the time we run the experiments, uh, we were already saving 25 to 30,000 hours of work per week in going to pick up. So uh, what I explained now is a little bit more, uh, more complicated, but in the, uh, at the bottom of it, there is nothing that 100-year-old uh, math. We didn't put at this state any machine learning or whatsoever, and we were able to uh, to gather a um, significant impact. Uh, the, there are interesting things uh, of this approach. Basically, the ETAs, calculating ETAs, if you consider that we might, at the same time, we might have thousands of requests and thousands of available drivers, and we have to compute the matrix of ETAs uh, from all of them, so we basically became a gold mine for commercial route providers. Uh, we, we may be at a peak, we are requesting 2,000, 3,000 uh, routes per second. And the problem with that is that it scales with the square of the size of the business. And for some reason, our CFO is not super happy about that. Um, and also, commercial results are not exactly what we are looking for. Because I don't want how long it takes from driving from A to B. What I really want is how long it takes for a driver who is currently in A, driving in a certain trajectory, if I offer him a ride, it will take some time for him to accept and to set up the, the GPS and, and all of those, and how long it will take for him to get to the pickup point. And those are very uh, significantly different questions. For example, I should never assign a ride to a driver who is about to enter a tunnel, right? Because he probably won't be able to, to accept the right, and I, am, and I am just waiting every one time. So, so the idea, the challenge that we face it is like, can we build our own ETA, estimation system? 
And now I will tell you what we built, which, because it has some pretty cool things that we found along the way. Uh, as I said, we are heavily dependent on ETA. For example, we need ETA to be able to show a price to the rider. I think that nowadays, no, everyone expects from, from a ride hailing, a decent ride hailing platform that you get a, a upfront pricing guaranteed and you don't want from 10 to 15 uh, euros, you want 12.25. Uh, that, that, uh, that means that we have to make a very wise prediction on how long the, the ride is going to take. As I explained, the assignment problem is the, is the biggest consumer of these of, of ETAs. And we also need uh, for simulation and experiments. Obviously, for improving the matcher, I can, we can do, as I told you before, which is running experiments. But if we are tweaking a parameter, we can, there, there is no possible time in, in, in life for, for us to be able to know if a parameter is 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Right? For, for that, we need simulations. And to make our simulation realistic, we need to know uh, how long would have taken for a driver to get to another, to another location. Um, so the, the idea is, uh, is simple because, yeah, what we have is we have a bunch of data about how long it takes from going from A to B because basically uh, all the time that our drivers are moving, they are feeding this, uh, this system. There is a catch that is like we won't be able to know which is the route because at evaluation time in the machine learning problem, uh, we will just have an original destination. And the other catch is like we don't have a map available, right? Uh, digital mapping is one of the most expensive things you can build. I don't know, the investment that Google has done in Google Maps is probably uh, over a billion nowadays. Uh, some of our competitors can afford building on their own maps. We, we are far from there yet. And, and also the, the other interesting thing is like we, we wanted to distinguish between the assignment ETA and the origin to drop off uh, ETA be because of what I explained to you before. Uh, so basically we, we got a, a, a bunch of rights and we start doing what you, any of you would have done, which is like, okay, let's, trust, let's extract some features. Uh, I don't know, the latitude and the longitude. The target is, of course, the time that it actually takes for the ride uh, to happen in, in real life. Uh, the Euclidean distance, the Manhattan distance, Haberstein distance, whatever you, uh, you want to do basic. And to the surprise of no one, it didn't work too well, right? Uh, but then there, there was the, the magic. And if we do the, the basic thing I explained before, every journey is just providing us with a data point, right? Uh, but actually, we, we have a lot of information. Like every five seconds, the, the car is telling us uh, where it is and where, it, where it's moving, where's the trajectory. Uh, and the idea is like, yeah, if we, instead of using a ride, uh, just the origin and drop-off, we use all the cells around, uh, there is something uh, quite magic that, that happens that is like this, sorry, yeah. Uh, these cells behave statistically very similar to words in a phrase. Uh, same way that you have uh, common words in English or Spanish or any language, like why, uh, we have very common cells. Typically, train stations, transportation hubs, airports. And just like uh, some, uh, natural language processing leverages the distance between words, so that, you know, Madrid is often next to city, so NLP learns that Madrid might be a city. Uh, we, we understand that uh, two cells tend to be connected if they, there is a major road going through them. Uh, so the crazy thing that when one of the, the, the person who thought of that in the team told me about, he said, like, yeah, that's crazy, that will not work, is what happens if we uh, if we apply to this problem techniques such as word to back or similar. Uh, more, uh, more general, these are embeddings, and the idea is to bring 
uh, the number of cells that we have is millions, but we could have a lower dimension representation that catches most of the variance, and therefore we understand how the city is built. And then instead of inputting the neural network with one million, uh, with, um, with one million rows full of zeros, we, we actually input the, the neural network with something a bit more uh, interesting to learn from. Uh, and this is exactly what, what that thing explains. I mean, I'm probably some of you have had work in machine learning techniques are kind of uh, familiar with, with the technique. Basically, you train another neural network and you cut it so that you get the low dimension representation of the high dimension space uh, you are trying to, uh, to study. Uh, and the cool thing is that it works. Um, basically, what we are presenting there is uh, one, yeah, I don't, I don't have a laser here, but it was uh, the cells that are closer in the sense of the, of the lower dimension space, uh, which come from the trajectories to a certain cell in the middle of that cluster. And as you can see, basically the system has understood the structure of the city, right? Because it populates a lot of cells as being closer, uh, close to the highway and also to the other highway that goes northeast. And basically it got all the major roads as being closer in the sense of the city, of the trajectories of the rights to the city that we were that we were looking for, and for sure there is that thing in the in the upper left corner that we were like, yeah, it didn't work, right? Because it's like, why are those cells uh, closer to the to the cluster? They, they are significantly disconnected. Can anyone guess what was in there? It's a tunnel, right? There is a tunnel between the, the cell next to Duque de Pastrana. Basically, it goes under, the, under the, rail, the rail station that is there. So it's pretty cool that the system has understood that uh, the structure on the city is there. And remember that I never fed the system with any sort of map. It just, got, it just uh, inferred the map from the, from the trajectories. And it's not totally cool so that I can give like talk samples that, yeah, it looks cool. Is that it actually works very well. Uh, this is uh, our naive model, what we used to have 300 seconds mean, mean, uh, mean absolute error. And now we are in 190, which is remarkable, remarkable because when we, uh, commercial providers, and the best one that we have found is Google Maps, is making 180. So it's like, yeah, I mean, we didn't put billions in the thing and cars in the street. I mean, we put a lot of cars, but they, they were not with the, with the cameras and so on. Uh, and we were able to, to understand. And we also, uh, this is an example of a, of a route, and is the, the estimations during, a, during an entire week. Uh, and it's basically how our system learned that there is a rush hour on the mornings, that there is the weekend where everything is calm. So it's basically understood the, the, entire, the entire pools of the city. Um, the other cool thing we built with this so that uh, we can scale the matcher up is that uh, using this system, we can build our own isochrones and replace the manual radiuses that I talked to you uh, before. We, by studying the manual rules, the only pattern that we could understand that all local teams were applying was that uh, they wanted, the, they wanted uh, drivers not to take more than X, minute to, X minutes to pick up, but because they have to define that in terms of, uh, in terms of, um, in terms of di bare distance, they were like, yeah, in the peak hour, the radius will be shorter. Uh, late at night, the radius will be larger. And in this area, because there are highways, the radius is larger. And if, so all of, the, all of those insights, uh, we were able to, to rebuild with this. That, as you can see, captures the pools of the city. As you can see, the, on, the, on the late at night, the, the isochrons cover most of the space. And it's also pretty cool because uh, if you realize, it catches also the highways. That's why you see uh, uh, that, it, that the isochron is, uh, is, not, is not rounded because if you are in a highway, you will get much, uh, much faster to, uh, to the center of, the, of there. And this was a super cool thing that we did very recently. Uh, 
just saying isochrons with 10 minutes help us uh, make our drivers more efficient than the 1800, uh, 1800 rules manually defined we used to have. So now we can start building complexity on top of this huge simplification, and now we will do things like, yeah, the cost of opportunity, if you are in the suburbs, you probably will be available for a time because there is not so much demand in there, so we might have a bigger isochron over that, and in the center of the city, the opposite. We are getting requests all the time, so it doesn't make any sense that you take seven minutes to go pick up anyone. Um, and the, the cool thing in here is that commercial APIs do not provide uh, this, or they do not provide it on the, re on the scale that, that we are interested to. So it, it's, it's really something uh, we, we are super happy with. And just the, the soup of logos that we use to, to build all of this. Uh, I think all of you are, are very familiar with, uh, with the tools mentioned in there. Uh, we are very, we don't get any discounts for saying this, but we, we are uh, very heavy users of Google Cloud and the TensorFlow and, and all of those, and we are kind of happy about it. I mean, you, when you play with cutting edge technology, you know you will suffer because many things you will be the first one that has been doing exactly what you're doing and, and that, but we are kind of uh, happy how things are progressing and the speed of progress and, the, and the, how fast they, they solve the issues. And <clears throat> the, what, we are now, uh, what we now want is to, be, to bring all this prototype to production. For production in Cabify, it means those requirements. We have to be up because we are something that the work of people depend, depends on. Uh, the scale is pretty high. We should be able to be able to answer 100,000 requests per second. Uh, the, the accuracy has to be no, non worse than 90% of the commercial accuracy, and uh, we should be able to, to auto-retain. So the reason why we are <laughs> doing these talks in the end is because the current data beam is great, but needs to grow to make all of these things happen. We current, these are our current, our current numbers, and I think I mentioned in the beginning, but I repeat because I know this is catchy. We have also development center in Brazil. Uh, and the plans for next year is to triple the number of data engineers and to double the number of data scientists. And if any of you is up for the challenge or know someone who is up for the challenge, you can always log in the cabify.com slash jobs, but you can also email me, but I'm a friendly guy, and we can, we can get past a lot of rural bureaucracy. Yeah, and that's, this is what I wanted to share with you today. Now is the time for the question. Over there. Hugo has many questions. As, you told, as I told you, he's the guy. He's always making questions. For the, the talk. Um, my question is, obviously building your own maps is, is very expensive as well Google has invested tons of money in it. Um, have you considered using open street maps? Yeah, we have, we have considered open using, I mean, we, in the early days of Cabify, of course we were using open street maps because we have no money, right? <laughs> uh, the thing that we, that we found is that in Latin America, the data is really poor. And we also, we actually are active, actively contributing to improve uh, that data, but we are mostly, mostly contributing in terms of places, like POIs in the map, uh, because the, the map thing is, is, um, is, is a serious business. And typically requires local authorities to be on board, and we have way too many issues to, to go first with local authorities before, before doing this, but we would love to, yeah. Okay. I mean, the, the project is awesome. Thanks, and it's, it's nice to hear that you contribute to the project. Thanks. Another question. We have time. So thanks for the talk. And have you thought about using a graph database? Uh, yeah. I mean, Neo4j or stuff like that? Yes, exactly. Uh, for the maps? Yes. The thing is, like as I explained, we don't have maps. We don't have segments in there. 
we are just using cells. And the other thing is like for most of the use cases that, that we are using here, the uh, databases are really slow. Just to give you an idea, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Michelangelo, which is the, feature, the centralized feature, uh, feature store architecture by Uber. Uh, we actually found, we and our friends from Gojek, which is basically the Cabify of Indonesia. Uh, the, the thing that we have uh, changed in that architecture is not having the features in Cassandra or Bigtable, but actually having it on Redis, because that's how fast uh, we need our features to be updated, right? For example, the, the ETA between a rider and a passenger, that, that changes super fast. So typically we are, we are not, uh, we have database problems, many, <laughs> as many as you can imagine. The core of Cabify is built on CouchDB, which is something really cool when you're in a small startup, but we are suffering like too much <laughs> and getting away of, of it. But for this, for this thing, we, we don't, I mean, we don't have a problem that I think is, is database is the solution. Uh, oh, there's another I th question. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, just a question out of curiosity. You've mentioned that you have the information about the trajectories, but are you considering also another uh, variable such as the weather or the time of the day? Yeah, th those are the kind of things that we, when we input in the model, it's like our system already knows. That's what, I'm, what I mean on being pervasive on people's life. Like, I don't need to know it's, 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 it's raining. I just need to know, I just know that car, I have a thousand cars in that area and they are moving much slowly. So I, I don't need, I, I, we haven't found any synergies using external data, but because we have too much of our own, of our own data. And my strategy in there is like, first let's make uh, as much, let's get as much value as possible from the data that we have and then we start considering external data such as GS GSM data for anomaly detection. I'm talking football games or stuff like that, but yeah. No more question? Last chance, five, four, three, <laughs> scary. two, one, go. Big applause for him. It's been a real honor to have you here.